Hi folks, I'm Adam, your instructor. Welcome to the Laney College Machine Shop. Today, we're going to be working on the FinderScope project for Machine Tech 210, the introductory course in machining and manufacturing. Specifically, we're going to be working on the eyepiece retainer, a sort of screw which retains the eyepiece or ocular lens in the focuser. We're going to take this 1 inch OD brass rod and turn it into this part, doing all the lathe and mill work. Before we get started on the machine, let's just take a few moments to review the features on the three-dimensional solid model and the specifications on the drawing. The three-dimensional solid model shows that this part is essentially a thin ring with external screw threads. One face has two shallow slots which are for tightening the retainer against the lens, although I think the term tighten suggests an excessive amount of force. We're really just trying to hold the lens in place. In any case, we'll be cutting the slots on the milling machine after all the other lathe work is done. Alright, here's the drawing. Before we jump into the views, let's get a lay of the land. Down in the title block at the bottom right, we can see that the title of the part is Eyepiece Retainer. Next to that, on the left, we can see that the material is going to be 360 brass. Brass is an alloy of copper and zinc, and it's both beautiful to look at and wonderful to machine. You'll enjoy working with this stuff. There are no special finish notes for this part because we're just going to leave the material as is. It will look really nice contrasted with the deep black and matte silver of the other components in the assembly. Further to the left, you can see the tolerance block, which specifies our standard shop tolerances for the different dimensions on the print where no other tolerance is specified. These are all based on significant digits, so the number of places after the decimal point determines the tolerance of that dimension. We'll also be looking for a standard 125 micro inch finish on all of the surfaces, and we're going to interpret everything on this print according to ASME Y14.5-2018, the most recent standard for print specifications. Okay, looking at the views themselves, we can see that some thoughtful person has provided an isometric view of the part for our reference, and we're given two orthographic projection views, what I would call a front view and a right side view. By the way, the right side view is also a section view. There are a bunch of dimensions which specify diameters, heights, and depths, and there's a screw thread notation too. In fact, that's the feature that's going to make this part interesting. This is the first time we're going to cut external screw threads using the lead screw of the lathe. This is a pretty involved process with lots of steps and new tools and machine controls we haven't used before. So it's just as good that the part is otherwise relatively simple and straightforward. Let's try to get a sense of the overall dimensions of this part so we know what we're dealing with. It looks like the largest diameter is actually going to be the major diameter of the 3 quarter 16 UNF 2A screw threads. So that's going to be very close to 3 quarters of an inch, but we'll come back to this point in a moment. The overall length is specified as 190 thousandths, so 3 quarters of an inch by 3 sixteenths of an inch is the size that you should visualize in your head. Okay. Looking at the dimensions a little bit closer now, we can see that the inside diameter is going to be 560 thousandths, which is 9 sixteenths of an inch, or 562 thousandths and 5 ten thousandths of an inch, rounded to two decimal places. The slots on the front face of the part have a width of 63 thousandths, or 1 16th of an inch, and a depth of 31 thousandths, or 1 32nd of an inch. It's hard to say if these are two separate slots, or the same slot that goes through both sides of the part. Take your pick, however you want to conceive of it. Now let's go back and take a closer look at the 3 quarter 16 UNF 2A screw threads, because we need to know more information about these threads than the other threads we've dealt with so far, which were either already made for us or which we simply cut into a hole with a tap. These threads will have a major diameter of 3 quarters of an inch. 
Actually, that's not quite true. Three quarters of an inch is the nominal diameter. This is just a fractional size that the threads are named for, and it doesn't have a tolerance attached to it. This is actually different than the major diameter, which as we'll find out here shortly, is slightly different than the nominal diameter, and does have a tolerance attached to it. The threads will have 16 threads per inch, or TPI, which indicates the spacing between the threads. Internal and external threads will only fit to one another if they have the same TPI. This number also tells us how we'll need to set up the feed rate on the lathe to properly cut the threads. And by the way, if you divide one inch by the number of threads per inch, you'll get the distance between two adjacent threads, called the pitch, another very useful bit of information. UNF refers to the thread standard. These are common 60-degree V-threads, defined by the Unified Thread Standard. That's what the UN stands for. The F indicates that, for the 3 quarter inch nominal diameter, 16 threads per inch is the fine pitch series. If this were UNC, the coarse series, then the threads would have 10 threads per inch. The TPI for fine and coarse series threads is all dependent on the nominal diameter. Smaller threads have generally finer TPI, and larger threads have generally coarser TPI. 2A refers to the class of fit. There are three generally used classes, 1, 2, and 3. 1 being looser and 3 being tighter. So a class 2 fit is in the middle and is the most common one you'll see for fasteners and other general purpose applications. The A designates these as external screw threads. If we were making a nut instead of a screw, it would be a B to designate internal screw threads. If we look in the upper right-hand corner of the drawing, we'll see a thread data table. This contains three key pieces of information which we'll need to know to successfully cut the threads. The major diameter, the pitch diameter, and the minor diameter. The major diameter is the outer diameter of the screw threads, measured over the crests of the threads. It's specified as 739 thousandths to 749 thousandths. Notice that this is close to, but not exactly the same as, the nominal diameter of 3 quarters of an inch, or 750 thousandths. It's just a little bit under. We'll first need to turn the outside diameter of the part to the major diameter before we can begin threading. Since it's a feature we'll actually be machining, it needs to have a tolerance attached to it. The minor diameter is the inner diameter of the screw threads, measured over the roots of the threads. Notice that this dimension is in parentheses and doesn't have a tolerance, it's just a reference dimension. Measuring the minor diameter at the roots of the threads is not an easy or common thing to do. We'll be using it during the threading process, but it's not the dimension we really care about. The pitch diameter is the most important dimension we'll need to know to make the threads, because it's the dimension we'll be trying to cut to during the threading process. Ultimately, the pitch diameter controls the fit between external and internal threads. You can think of it as sort of in between the major diameter and minor diameter, but more properly, it's the diameter at which the width of the threads and the width of the grooves between them are equal. Here it's specified as 703 thousandths to 708 thousandths, so that's only a 5 thousandths total tolerance. And FYI, measuring the pitch diameter will require special tools, which I think is always kind of neat. Now, if you're wondering where these numbers came from, I didn't just make them up. They're all predefined in standard thread tables like these in the Machinery's Handbook, the ubiquitous machine shop reference text. The standards ensure that a threaded component made in any machine shop anywhere in the world will fit another threaded component made in another machine shop anywhere else in the world. It's a way of controlling the interchangeability of parts. But if you're just trying to fit two threaded components together, which is kind of what we're doing here, you don't really need to make them to the standard. Still, cutting standard screw threads is a worthwhile challenge and will prepare you for future work. Okay, that's pretty much it for the print. I think we're ready to start making some chips, so let's head out to the shop. 
Normally, the first step would be to cut our stock, but since this part is small and relatively thin, there wouldn't really be a good way to hold onto a piece of stock if it were close to the final length and still be able to get access with a tool to cut the outside and inside diameters. So we'll be using a different method. We'll stick a longer piece of stock material in the lathe chuck and machine the part into one end of it. Then we'll do what's called a part-off operation to separate the finished part from the rest of the stock material. Then the stock material can go back into the stock rack for the next person to use, and we can just keep going on like this until the stock material is too short to be usable. This is actually a very efficient way to use material, and since it minimizes the number of setups, it also leads to better precision on the part. So go ahead and find a piece of 1 inch diameter brass rod that's somewhere between 1 and a half inches and 12 inches long. Just a note on material identification. Brass is easy to identify because of its yellow color. Remember that brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. Bronze, another common material, is an alloy of copper and tin. It has a more orange color. And just plain copper is more red in color. Let's gather up some tools. We'll need the turning facing tool slash chamfering tool, which was ground out of high speed steel. We'll need a number four high speed steel center drill and a 9 16th of an inch high speed steel twist drill. We'll need a part off blade with a carbide insert and a threading tool with a carbide insert. And finally, we'll need a 1 16th of an inch wide slitting saw. And that's it. All right, onto the lathe. And we're gonna use the same 5C collet chuck as the work holding device for this part. So grab a one inch collet and clean off the tapers on both the collet and the collet chuck. Line up the keyway in the collet with the key in the collet chuck and install the collet. Turn the big rubber wheel to draw in the collet then install the stock material. Adjust the stick out of the material to about one inch, and then tighten the collet all the way. Go ahead and install the turning facing tool. Turn on the spindle and touch off the tool on the end of the stock material. Now face off about 10 to 20 thousandths just to clean up that surface. Now we can remove the turning facing tool. Now we need a drill chuck, so go ahead and install that into the tailstock and then install a number four center drill into the drill chuck. Turn on the spindle and spot the hole, and notice that I'm not using any lubricant here. You don't really need to use any lubricant when you're machining brass. One of the many nice things about it. Okay, remove the center drill from the drill chuck and remove the drill chuck from the tailstock. Now we need the 9 16 of an inch high speed steel twist drill, and once again, the Morse taper on the end of this drill is not the right size for the quill of the tailstock, so we will need to use an adapter. So jam those together, and then install the whole thing into the tailstock. We're only going to be drilling to a certain depth with this tool, so we need some way to track how far we've fed the tool into the part. Turns out that the quill on the tailstock has these very handy inch and millimeter graduations on it, so we can just use those. I'm going to move the quill forward so that the one inch mark lines up with the front of the tailstock. Then I'll just bump the entire tailstock up the bedways of the lathe. The whole point of this is just to get the tip of the drill to line up with the end of the part. Then I'll lock the tailstock down so that it doesn't move, and I'll feed the drill into the part using the quill hand wheel. From the one inch mark, I'll go in seven graduations, so that's seven sixteenths of an inch. Notice that I'm measuring this depth from the tip of the drill rather than from the full diameter of the drill, which is what we usually do. That's because the depth of the drill is not super critical. We just need to go deep enough so that when we part off the part, uh, the drill will have gone all the way through, but we don't want to drill so deep that we end up wasting material. Okay, and now we can pull the drill out. Another thing that you may notice is that even though this drill is larger than a half of an inch, I did not pilot drill the hole, and there's a very good reason for that. Brass, as a material, is known for being sort of grabby when you drill it, meaning that the material will kind of grab onto the drill, and that will cause the drill to sort of corkscrew into the part. This can cause the drill to get sucked into the part, or the part to get sucked out of the chuck, neither of which is desirable. 
There are a couple of ways to help mitigate this issue, and one that I think works well for a part like this is simply to not use a pilot drill. So in this case, the web of the drill is actually helping to stabilize the cut. I suppose I should mention, even if just in passing, that to keep twist drills from grabbing as they break through the material at the bottom of a through hole, they're commonly modified by grinding a flat on the cutting edges. This is often called a zero rake drill. Here's one sitting next to a standard drill for comparison. It's an easy modification to make, and it really changes the way the drill cuts. Anyway, it's a nuance, but it's worth mentioning. Okay, we can push the tailstock back out of the way and remove the drill. And we need the turning facing tool again. Turn on the spindle and touch off on the outside diameter of the material. Now dial in a cut of like 10 to 20 thousandths of an inch and take that cut to clean up the surface. We only need to cut to a length of about 7 sixteenths of an inch or 440 thousandths. This is not super critical, again this is just enough so that we can make the part, but not so much that we uh, waste stock material. All right, now let's measure that diameter with a micrometer, and this looks like 983 thousandths of an inch. As we've done so many times in the past, I will set that value for the x-axis on the digital readout. The diameter that we're trying to cut to right now is the major diameter of the 3 quarter 16 UNF 2A threads. The thread data table tells us that the size limit for the major diameter is going to be 739 thousandths to 749 thousandths. So anywhere inside of that range is fine. We're going to need to take some roughing cuts to get the diameter closer to the final size. So let's shoot for maybe 10 thousandths of an inch over the final dimension, so like 760 thousandths. That's going to be five roughing cuts of approximately 50 thousandths of an inch. And let's take a measurement with a micrometer just to make sure that we're coming out to size. And that looks like it's right on the money for 760 thousandths, so that's great. I'll go ahead and take the final cut, shooting for just under the top of the tolerance of 749 thousandths. All right, we're done with the turning facing tool, and now we need the part-off blade. The carbide insert on the part-off blade has a sort of square edge, so you can use it to make square-sided grooves. But its real purpose is for parting off, which is essentially like grooving, but grooving all the way to the center line of a part so that whatever's on the end comes off. Hopefully you can see that the part-off blade itself is mounted in its own blade holder, so the stick-out of the blade is adjustable to accommodate various different sizes of parts. We are going to use this tool to part off, but for right now we're just going to use it to make what's called a thread relief groove. This is a groove immediately after a threaded portion on a part, which is essentially there just to provide us with a nice, convenient place to stop the threading tool during the threading process. Let's line up the right side of the part off tool with the end of the part. This is easily accomplished by using a ruler like a straight edge. Just set one edge of the ruler up against the end of the part, and then move the carriage so that you position the right side of the tool so that it also touches the edge of the ruler. And now the tool and the end of the part should be aligned to one another at the same z-axis position. So go ahead and zero out the z-axis on the DRO at this position. Now move the tool in 200 thousandths of an inch. This is 10 thousandths of an inch over the overall length of the part, which is 190 thousandths. All right, now touch the tool off on the outside diameter of the part. And actually, I just realized that I forgot to take a final measurement of that outside diameter, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now with a micrometer. That's looking like just over 746 thousandths of an inch. So I'm going to set the x-axis on the digital readout to that value. All right, turn on the spindle and feed the tool straight in on the x-axis to 650 thousandths. Why this number? Well, remember that the minor diameter of the threads was specified as 674 thousandths. We want the thread relief groove to be just a little bit under that so that the threading tool clears. 650 thousandths is 24 thousandths of an inch under the minor diameter, and it's a nice round number for us to use. 
Okay, now I'm going to move the tool over another 125 thousandths of an inch, an eighth of an inch. So from 200 thousandths, we're going to move to 325 thousandths. And then I'm going to plunge straight in on the x-axis to 650 thousandths again. All we're trying to do here is widen the groove to give ourselves enough space to comfortably stop the threading tool. Okay, it looks like there's a little bit of remnant material there in the center, so I'm going to feed over a little bit and plunge into 650 again just to kind of get rid of that. Yeah, looks a lot better. Okay, we're done with the part-off blade for now, and we need the high-speed steel chamfering tool. Turn the spindle on, then touch off the tool on the front outside edge of the part. Then feed in along the z-axis 40 thousandths of an inch. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing on the other side, and you're going to have to get the tip of the chamfering tool really close, or even touching, the thread relief groove. Then touch off on that inside edge, and once again, feed along the z-axis 40 thousandths of an inch, although now you're going the opposite way, going away from the chuck rather than toward the chuck. These chamfers are the entry and exit chamfers for the threads. They are very important, but their dimensions are not explicitly stated anywhere on the drawing. You just have to know that they need to be there. And they only need to be big enough to provide a gradual entry and exit for the screw threads. And these are looking pretty good, so we're done with those. But since we've already got the chamfering tool out, let's go ahead and break the inside edge of the hole that we drilled. So flip the tool around in the tool holder so that it's pointing at the end of the part, and then just break that inside edge maybe 15 thousandths of an inch. Okay, we're done with the chamfering tool, and now it's time for the threading tool. Before we start threading, there are a couple things that we need to set up on this tool. And the first thing is that we need to ensure that the 60 degree V form on the end of the carbide insert is properly aligned to the part. The tool that we use for this is called a center gauge, although I sort of lovingly call it a fishtail gauge. And it's a very, very simple tool. It's got some straight edges, and then it also has some 60 degree Vs cut into it. For this part, the easiest thing to do is probably to set one of the straight edges against the end of the part like this, so that the fishtail is pointing toward the tool. Then kind of align the tool and the gauge so that the left side cutting edge of the tool is very close to uh, the left side of the fishtail. What we're doing here is looking at that narrow gap between the tool and the gauge. If the angle of the tool is correctly set in the tool holder, then that gap will be uniform from one end to the other. If it isn't, then you'd need to loosen the set screws on the tool holder, pivot the tool a little bit, retighten all the set screws, and then check that gap again. Just keep adjusting until the gap is uniform from one end to the other. By the way, I don't know if you can tell this, but I did put a piece of plain white printer paper below the tool and the part, and that just improves the contrast inside of that gap between the tool and the gauge. It's just a little trick that might help you see better. Anyway, this is actually looking pretty good. The tool looks like it's quite well aligned, so we're good there. The next thing that we need to do is just touch off the tip of the tool on the outside diameter of the part and then we can set the x-axis on the DRO to that value. Before I go into a detailed explanation of the threading process, I think it will be helpful to show you what the process is going to look like when all is said and done. You can see here that we're going to be cutting with the thread tool from right to left, starting a little ways from the end of the part, and stopping inside the thread relief groove. The spindle speed will be pretty slow, because we'll be feeding pretty darn fast. In fact, feeding at a rate equal to the pitch of the threads. So 1 inch divided by 16 threads per inch is like 62 thousandths per revolution. That's pretty darn fast. We'll be taking successive cuts, taking a little more off each pass until we get to the final depth. The thread form, that 60 degree V shape, will be generated by the shape of the threading tool itself, which is why it was so important to properly align it to the part. The thing that I find so magical about cutting screw threads on the lathe is that every time you take a cut, the tool finds exactly the same spot in that helical tool path. I mean, it's just amazing to me. However, it will only work if the tool and the machine are set up properly, and if your timing is right. So let's go through this one step at a time. The first thing is to take a look at the feed chart on the front of the headstock. 
we'll be cutting inch screw thread, so we'll be looking at this part of the chart right here. More specifically, we'll be cutting 16 TPI screw threads, so that should be right there in the chart. So the combination that we'll need to set the quick change gearbox to will be L, B, S, 1, V. So L for low, B, S, we're already in S, 1, V. And notice that when all the gears are in mesh, this long threaded shaft called a lead screw starts spinning. The lead screw is what we'll be using to feed the tool. More on that in a second. The chart and the quick change gearbox combination that I just showed you applies to the Acra and LeBlond lathes that we have in our shop. But if you're using one of these larger sharp lathes, it's gonna look a little bit different. The feed chart is on the far left side of the headstock and it looks like this. For inch screw threads, we'll be using the top part of the chart right here. For 16 TPI threads, the combination is going to be R, P, A, E, 1. So that's R, P, A, E, and we're already at E, 1. Again, notice that the lead screw is spinning now. Okay, back on the Acra LeBlond lathe, we're looking at the far right side of the apron now, and we can see the lead screw rotating in the background, and we can also see in the foreground this little dial called a chasing dial rotating as well. That little button right there is a reference marker that tells you when to engage this lever right here to grab onto the lead screw and start feeding the tool based off of the kind of threads that you're cutting. So let me turn off the machine and flip up the chasing dial so that we can see this little hidden chart. This chart tells us where we can engage on the chasing dial based on the number of threads per inch that we're cutting. For 16 TPI threads, which is what we're going to be cutting, it turns out that we can engage at any position on the chasing dial, meaning on any line, whether it has a number or not. But it must be on a line. It can't be in between two lines because then the threading tool won't line up. Now let me flip this up all the way so that you can see the little gear on the bottom. This gear actually rides on the lead screw and it's what drives the chasing dial. That's how the two are synchronized. So if I swing this back down and lock it and then turn on the lathe so that the lead screw is rotating, you can actually see this in operation. Now behind the chasing dial gear is another very, very important threading related component called the half nut. The half nut is what you engage when you press down on this lever and start threading. The half nut is literally a threaded nut sliced in half. And when you depress that lever, you bring the two halves in toward each other and they grab onto the lead screw. And that's what causes the carriage to feed. It's all mechanical. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's try a practice run and see how it goes. The tool is positioned away from the part right now, so I'm not actually going to do any cutting yet. Okay, I've got my hand on the half nut lever, and I'm just waiting for, let's say, that one to come around, engage, and you can see it starts feeding immediately. When I get to the thread relief groove, I'm going to pull up on the lever, and we're stopped right there in the thread relief groove. Think you got it? Let's do one for real. Back to the start of the cut, and we'll feed into, let's say, 736 on the x-axis, so this will be a cut of ten thousandths of an inch. Now, I've got the half-nut cam set up in the bottom left corner to make the timing a little bit easier to see. Waiting for it, engage right there, it's feeding, and then pull up to stop in the thread relief groove. Pull it back and go to the start of the cut. What do you think? Kind of exciting, right? All right, before we move on, let's just verify that we're actually set up to cut the threads that we want to. We'll use one of these thread pitch gauges, which has a bunch of leaves on it with different numbers of threads per inch stamped into them. We'll find the one for 16 TPI and fold the others away, and then we'll line the teeth on the gauge up with the sort of helical scribed line that we just made in the part surface. Not much length to go by here, but to me, it looks like the spacing is correct, so let's move on. Let's move into 726 thousandths now, and then we'll engage the half nut right there, take the cut and stop in the thread relief groove, pull it back, go back to the start. Then we'll go in, let's see, how far are we going to go in this time? 
Let's do another cut of 10 thousandths, so 716 thousandths on the x-axis on the DRO, and gauge the half nut, take the cut, stop inside the thread relief groove, and then position back at the start. Do you kind of get the dance now? I think you probably do. I think we don't really need the half nut cam any longer, but I will zoom in a little bit so that you can see a little bit closer what's happening at the part. We'll dial in another cut of 10 thousandths, so 706 thousandths on the x-axis on the DRO, and then we'll take that cut, then dial in another cut at 696 thousandths, and take that cut just as before, and then let's do one more cut at 686 thousandths, and take that cut. So here's the deal, folks. Since we touched off the tip of the threading tool on the major diameter, we could hypothetically just cut to our minor diameter, 674 thousandths, and that would get us very, very close to the thread depth that we want. And that's essentially what we've been doing to rough out the threads. But there are a number of variables at play here that make this not a reliable way to finish the threads. Remember that the minor diameter is just a reference dimension. The diameter that we really care about here for controlling the size of the threads is the pitch diameter. That's what really matters here. That's what controls the fit between the external and internal threads. And that needs to be 703 thousandths to 708 thousandths. And the special tool that we're going to use to measure the pitch diameter is called a pitch micrometer. So I'm going to open up the pitch mic and position it over top of the threads. And it's going to look something like this, where the two triangles in the anvil are straddling one of the threads. And then the cone in the spindle of the micrometer is between two threads. Hopefully you can see that the tool is not contacting the major or minor diameters of the threads. It's actually touching on the sides of the threads, the thread flanks. And so it's actually measuring the pitch diameter. Now, once I think I've got this set correctly, I'm going to sort of rock it through the largest part of the threads to make sure that I'm actually measuring directly across that biggest part of the diameter. Okay, now I can read this just like any other micrometer. And this looks to me like just over 725 thousandths of an inch. And just to point out the markings on the thimble here that say 14 to 18 P, so those indicate that this pitch micrometer will only give you correct readings for screw threads that have between 14 to 18 TPI. Our 16 TPI threads are right smack dab in the middle of that range, so that's great. But make sure when you grab the pitch micrometer that you grab the right ones with the right range, because we've got them in basically all of the different sizes. Okay, make sure to position your tool where you took your last cut on the x-axis, and then we're going to set the x-axis to the measured value of our pitch diameter. That was 725 thousandths. Let's dial in another 10 thousandths cut, so to 715 thousandths now. And take that cut, and now it's time to dial in a finish cut at, let's say, 706 thousandths. This is in between the 703 thousandths to 708 thousandths size range for the pitch diameter. And then we'll take that finish cut. Time for a final measurement with the pitch micrometer, and that's telling me 707 thousandths. Okay, so we're one thousandths away from our target. Still inside the tolerance, everybody's happy. Of course, the final test is, does it fit? And it looks like it does. The focuser screws on just fine. In fact, it's a little bit loose. The tapped hole in the focuser is probably on the looser side, but looks good to me. The threads are done at long last! <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too bad though. Cutting screw threads can be a little nerve-wracking at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's kind of fun. 
One thing I will say as an addendum is that there are many machinists out there, myself included, who would argue that the process we just used is the improper way to cut screw threads on a lathe. It's not a wrong way to do it, it's just not the most right way. The most right way involves some additional setup steps, and it's more reliable when cutting large, coarse threads in tough materials. But you know, for what we're doing here, I think it adds too much unnecessary complexity and confusion to what is already a pretty tricky process. Once you feel comfortable with basic thread cutting, I'll go back and show you the finer points. In any case, we are done with the threading tool, and now we need the part-off blade again. We'll align the right side of the tool to the front of the part using the ruler, just as we did before. Zero out the z-axis on the DRO right there, and then move in a hundred and ninety thousandths. The final overall length of our part is 190,000, so we're actually going to part it off to size. Now, we need something to catch the part when it becomes separated from the rest of the stock material, and I'm just going to use this T-handle hex wrench because it was handy, but it could be almost anything. I'm going to stick that inside the hole, and then I'll just start cranking away on the cross slide to feed the part off blade through the part. And there it goes. It's just that easy. Looking pretty good, although we do have a substantial burr on the back side, which is pretty normal. Luckily, you can remove that very easily just with some pliers. And then I would go in after that with just one of these triangular scraper deburrers and break that edge by hand. All right, this part is almost done. Just one more thing to do. And we're going to need the milling machine for that. You can see that I already have a vise set up. We're going to need some pretty tall parallels, like inch and a half parallels, so that the part is sticking up high enough out of the jaws. Just like this, sort of sandwiching it in its thin direction. And then we're going to need a half inch collet. And then the 1 16th wide slitting saw goes into that. All right, I'm going to raise the table as much as I can to limit the stick out of the quill. And then I'll bring the tool down with the quill just to gently touch off on the top of the part. Then I'll zero the Z axis on the DRO right there. I'm going to lift the tool back up a little bit and then move the part out of the way. Then I'll bring the tool back down to zero and an additional 32 thousandths of an inch. Why 32? Well, because that's basically 1 32nd of an inch, which is half of 1 16th of an inch, which is the width of the slitting saw. If I want those slots on the front face of the part to be on the center line, then I need to base the position of the slitting saw on the center of the teeth. So I'll go ahead and zero the z-axis on the DRO again. And then I'll move down from there 373 thousandths. Again, why 373 thousandths? Well, because the measured major diameter of the threads that we cut was 746 thousandths, half of which is 373. Okay, at this point, so that the cutter doesn't move around on us, it's very important to lock the quill. Turn on the spindle, then feed the table along the y-axis to gently touch the tool off on the front face of the part. Then zero the y-axis on the DRO right there. Clear the part away from the tool, then go back into your y-axis zero plus 31 thousandths of an inch, which is going to be the depth of our slot. Okay, and then feed the table along the x-axis to cut that slot all the way through the part. Now, I realize looking at this that it might be kind of difficult for you to make out what's happening from this perspective. So I'm going to feed the slitting saw through the part one more time at this camera angle, and hopefully that will uh, seal the deal a little bit. Make sense? I hope so. In any case, we're done with the slitting saw, so we can retract the quill, clear the chips, pop the slitting saw out, and then remove the collet. And we can remove the part from the vise, because it's done! And it looks pretty freaking cool, if you ask me. I just love the color and luster of brass. What a beautiful part. And your first screw threads cut on the lathe. Wow. I mean, just think about how far you've come. In fact, if you made it this far, 
go sit down in a comfy chair by a fire and enjoy some hot cocoa while you ponder the meaning of it all. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.